Hey, this is Mrs. Sharp, and I thought I would take some time to go through with you um, the answers to your review activity today, just to help you out if you happen to have any trouble. Remember, I said you want to pinpoint the ones you were having trouble with. So maybe just to help you if you weren't sure, to double check your answers, things like that. So we start with 1 1, identifying branches of chemistry. So for answers, site of an oil spill determines effect, I would say environmental for sure. Um, environmental because it's affecting the environment. I would say um, maybe biochemical or biochemistry because it's determining the effects of that spill on living systems or reactions within systems. Maybe analytical to see what are the chemicals that are creating the problem. Um, I'm sure there you could maybe finagle other ones into that, but I would say those are the big three. A researcher at a hospital looks at the effects of using, I would say, analytical. Okay, so what is the drug or the chemical and what, how is it affecting? I would say um, biochemical. Absolutely. Um, organic, because most of your compounds are carbon-based. A scientist investigates whether or not water could be used as a fuel for automobiles. I would throw in thermochemical there, because or even physical, because we are looking at kind of the energy change as a result of these chemical reactions in cars. I should say chemistry. Um, also, I would say industrial, because we want to do it on a large scale. And again, not that you couldn't have other ones, but these are probably the main ones that you should think about. Look over those types of chemistry. All right. Identify which state of matter is being described. Molecules contain the most kinetic energy. That should be a gas. Um, number two, they're moving at room temperature. Should be all three. Constant shape and constant volume should be solid. Non-constant shape and constant volume should be a liquid. So again, these types of questions definitely be on there tomorrow. Look at your notes. Have someone quiz you, especially for these sorts of questions. Okay, endo and exo, had a lot of trouble with these today. Remember, en endothermic means energy is required, or energy in, exo, exit, energy is exiting, or energy is being released. So for all of these, first you gotta figure out what the heck is going on. So sublimation is going from a solid to a gas, you're going to need energy to get something from a solid to a gas because solid has less energy than a gas. So it goes um, least is solid, then liquid, then gas has the most energy. So molecules are moving with the least amount of kinetic energy. Molecules are moving with the most amount of kinetic energy. Fusion is melting, so that's from a liquid to, I'm sorry, melting would be from a solid to a liquid. So since it's going up in energy, energy is required. So I forgot to write those. That's endo for both. Condensation, I'm going down in energy, gas to liquid. Since I'm going down, energy is going down, energy must be released, so that's exo. Vaporization is from a liquid to a gas, so energy is required. Deposition is from a gas to a solid, so we're going down in energy, so that's exo. Solidification is from a liquid to a solid going down in energy, so that's got to be exo. So two things to this. One is you needed to know the terms for everything and what that meant. Second, you had to know what these definitions were and applying it to the fact that these have different amounts of energy. Next, phase diagrams. Here we go. Label each letter according to the phase of matter it represents. C is a gas. B is a liquid, A is a solid. Makes sense because at high pressures, high pressure up here, and low temperatures, psych, we should have solids. So at high pressure is kind of compacting those molecules together. And at a gas, at low pressures, high temperatures, low pressure, high temperatures, molecules can move far apart. Sorry about the mistake there. It's late in the day, guys. I've taught all day, and it's 5, and I'm tired, and I'm not doing a great job. But hopefully it's still going to help you. 
At which temperature and pressure do all three phases exist simultaneously? That one right there. So that looks like negative 15 degrees Celsius and about 6 atmosphere. That's called the triple point. At room temperature and pressure, what phase? Well, room temperature is about 25 degrees and one atmosphere. So that would be a gas. If the temperature is held constant at zero, change my marker here, but the pressure is decreased from 300 to 25, so we're going from here to about here, what kind of phase change would occur? Well, I'd go from a solid to a liquid, and that is melting or fusion. And the critical point is right here. Remember, that means it's such a high temp and high pressure that the liquid and the gas, you kind of can't tell what's going on because they're so packed together, it's like a liquid, but it's so hot and so much energy that it's like a gas. Okay. Okay, for your unknown sample, intensive properties, remember, I'm just going to mention here, intensive properties do not depend on size. So examples would be color, odor, state, texture, density, solubility, malleability, won't run out of space, ductility, others. Extensive properties do depend on the size. So in other words, they change based on the size. So mass, volume, weight. Ooh, where does density go? Over here. Density doesn't change based on size. What could you do to determine the chemical properties? See what it reacts with. And see what it doesn't react with. Remember, if it reacts with oxygen, it's combustible. Moving on. Physical and chemical change. You, based on our discussions today, need to look at your pieces of evidence. There are eight in your notes for 1.5. Check them out. Dissolving sucrose in water is physical. Two clear color solutions, formation of a white powdery substance, that's called a precipitate. That's one of your eight pieces of evidence, so that's chemical. Milk spoiling, you've got an odor change. That's chemical. Mixing baking soda and vinegar, you've got gas release. You've got heat absorbed. You've got a change in odor. It's chemical. Formation of kidney stones is a precipitate. That's chemical. Burning a candle, heat release, light released, chemical. Dry ice sublimating, that's going from a solid to a gas. That's just a phase change. That's physical. Liquid nitrogen exploding. It exploded because it went from a liquid to a gas. It vaporized. That's just a physical, even though it exploded. And cracking a glow stick, you've got light released and um, a color change. That's chemical. 1.6, law of conservation of mass. By the way, there's some more good practice problems on the blog for this. Student carefully placed 15.6 grams of sodium in a reactor with an excess quantity of chlorine, so sodium with chlorine, and they're making, when the reaction was complete, 39.7 grams of sodium chloride. Some of you are getting lazy and skipping the step. It takes you about five seconds, and it sure is helpful. So let's look at what we got. 15.6 grams of sodium, and we know that at the end we've got 39.7 grams of sodium chloride. So according to the law of conservation of mass, whatever's on this side has to equal whatever's on this side. So whatever chlorine is has to combine with sodium to equal 39.7. So we take 39.7, we're going to subtract our 15.6. Whatever is left over is our mass of chlorine. So let's say that would be 0.1, 9 minus 5, 24.1 grams. And how many grams of sodium reacted? 15.6. It says so in the problem. 
Number two, I wanted to, again, give you these numbers to worry about, except for you don't worry about them. So I've got x2 reacting with y to form xy. We can forget about these numbers and just work with our masses. So I've got a 12.2 gram sample here, 78.9 grams being made here, and I need to know how much y reacted. So whatever 78.9 minus 12.2 is, is how much of this I need so that the law of conservation of mass is true. 66.7 grams. Remember, more help with this on the blog under 1.6 help. All right, here we go for 1.7. How would I classify all of these? That's an element, pure. C is also an element, it's diatomic but those are both elements. This is a mixture of elements. This is a pure compound. This is a mixture of compounds, elements, mixture of elements, mixture of elements. Which letter are pure substances? Um, any A's and B's are pure. Made or separated by physical change? Any mixture, so C's, D's, and E's. You can separate those mixtures. Um, made or separated by chemical change? Any compounds? Only elements cannot be separated by either, so that would be A. And we're talking about these letters this time. Okay, homogeneous and heterogeneous are alike and different. So alike, they can be made and separated by physical change. And they both... Um, have components that you can identify. Um, for different, homogeneous are uniform, where heterogeneous are non-uniform. And I should have just said one way. That's really the major way. How could these be separated? Salt water evaporation, sand and water filtration, alcohol and water distillation, and two different color eeks, chromatography. There's a video about chromatography on the blog if you're not sure about that. The rest are pretty straightforward, I think. Okay, determine percent by mass or percent composition of elements. So for percent carbon in this problem, we're going to need the mass of the carbon over the mass of the compound, the whole thing. So that's going to be 3 grams of carbon over 11.01 .01 grams. That's 3 and the 8.01 times 100, I'm sorry, which gives us roughly 27.3%. Since it's only carbon and oxygen, I don't even have to do all this to figure it out. It would be 8.01 over 11.01, .01, but the percent oxygen is just whatever is left over, which gives me 72.7%. Down here, if you do 12 over 32, that would give you the percent carbon, and that comes out to be 27.3%. So according to this, the percent carbon is the same. Since it's only got carbon and oxygen in it, the percent oxygen must also be the same. So if that's the case, then yes, these two could be considered the same. All right, law of multiple proportions. I'm going to skip this one because it's so poorly worded. Move on to this one. Compound one contains point. 580 grams of fluorine for every 1 gram of xenon. So 1 gram of xenon and 0 .580 grams of fluorine. Compound 2 contains 0.29 grams of fluorine for every 1 gram of xenon. What is the formula of compound 2? So compound 1 is XeF4. Now what happens from here to here? The whole number ratio of fluorine to fluorine, compound 1 to compound 2, is 2 to 1. So the ratio of fluorines here to here must be 2 to 1. So in other words, twice as much in compound 1 as it is in compound 2. So compound 2 must be XEF2. More of these practice problems on the blog under 1.10.
practice. Got some density problems, last but not least. For the first one, um, it needs the reading of the graduated cylinder, that's volume. You use your correct volume formula, that's V equals M over D. So you should get 59.8 grams over 0 0.800 grams per milliliter. If you punch that into your calculator, you get 74.75 milliliters. For number two, you want mass. The correct formula is D times V. And again, look how my units canceled out in that last one. So I have 8.93 grams per cubic centimeter, and you have a 258 cubic centimeter sample. Cubic centimeters cancel, you're left with grams. I'm punching into my calculator 8.93 times 258, which gives me a big number, 2,303.94 units are grams. And if you think about both of these problems, they really make sense in terms of numbers. This has a very large density, 8.93 grams for every cubic centimeter. Well, you have a lot more than one, you have 260. So it makes sense that we're gonna have a very large mass. Up here, we've got 59.8 grams. The density, I have less grams than milliliters. For every one milliliter, I have 0.8 grams. So it makes sense that I should have more milliliters than grams, and I do, 74.75 to 59.8. Um, number three, this pipe will float. It contains air. Air has a density of much less than one, which is the density of water. So the combined density of the copper, so if you think of a copper pipe here, if the ends are closed off, or even if the ends are open, before the water can rush through, yeah, the copper is 8.93 grams per cubic centimeter, but the air inside is really small in terms of density. So if you think about how much copper you have and how much air you have, these two numbers kind of average out to be much less than one, which means it's going to float. Okay, hope that helped you review. Have a great night and I will see you tomorrow.